There's a lot that I could say about Shongwa. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, he is known for many, many things. He first became well known for his work in computational geometry and meshing and using this to help out people in scientific computing. He's very well known for work that we've done together in smooth analysis of algorithms and numerical linear algebra. And most recently is famous for work on determining the complexity of computing Nash equilibria. He is one of the most intellectually diverse researchers I've met. You know, within computer science, he also has papers in things like parallel compilers and graphics and statistics. And sort of anywhere he goes, people find a way to write a paper with him. He is partially responsible for yins existing here. He was the one who really introduced me to the idea of doing interdisciplinary research when many years ago, too many years ago, he suggested that we should try to understand how people were using spectral algorithms in scientific computing and had the idea that maybe there was something formal we could prove about them. And that's how I first sort of broke out of my shell, of my own little academic community. Uh, he's won an absurd number of awards, so let me not list them and just let him begin talking. Thank you, so much. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dan. And uh, uh, I used to come to Yale very often because I used to be in Boston, and it's just a t three hours drive, two hours. And uh, you know, once I began to go to California, it's just really quite far away. And now, particularly when I have a, a young daughter, it's become even further away. So, <clears throat> so, so, so in this talk, I would like to uh, present a, a, a very recent work, which uh, we actually just submitted early this year. And it's a joint work with uh, Wei Chen, who is uh, a researcher at the Microsoft Asia Lab. Uh, Wei is a, a leading expert in network uh, influence. Okay, so, um, so this research basically touches three areas that I enjoy studying. Uh, one is network analysis, one is game theory, and uh, the others are algorithm designs. And uh, I hope one day it will have a machine learning components. Uh, it's another area which I would love to understand more. So <clears throat> I would like to start with a short discussion uh, for two purposes. One is uh, to provide at least some basic back motivation of the work. And secondly, in the spirit of machine learning, it will give you a little bit of sample data of my accent. <laughs> so hopefully, by the time I reach my technical section, you are trained. Uh, <coughs> so, <coughs> so, so network science and graph theory are a wonderful match, as many people can see. And uh, um, you know, for people, who, for researchers who study graph theory or graph algorithms, and network science uh, has you know, become a wonderful playground, or sometimes even Disneyland to us. And uh, you know, there's many beautiful network phenomena and applications that have enriched the subject that we study, uh, but also, uh, I think, enriched the practical relevance of our studies. And uh, um, so clearly, the, uh, the connection between uh, practical graphs and graph theory has evolved over the years. So for example, <clears throat> 20 years ago when the internet and the web began to uh, emerge, and uh, we used to say, no worry, they can be represented as graphs. And naturally, uh, the, practical, the, the connection between practical network and graph theory uh, stretch beyond just graph theoretical representation. Uh, you know, graph algorithms and graph concepts have been used as quite useful, sometimes powerful tools for understanding network structures. Of course, today, uh, kids, you know, know about social networks way before they take any class in graph concept, and uh, which is cool uh, because we cannot say to them, no worry, you know, graph is not that abstract. Uh, they can be viewed as uh, Facebook or any social network or information network that uh, you know, right? So, <clears throat> but I think network science is beyond graph theory. And uh, in practice, network data are often 
richer than just the graph representations. Right? So in practice, network data may have uh, many facets, and uh, its graph structure is just uh, some of the basic facets of the network data. Right? So in this talk, somehow I would like to at least take a very humble step to words try to understand some of the network data beyond just graph uh, representation. So that's essentially the purpose of this research. Um, I hope this is enough training data. So, uh, <clears throat> so let me start with a very simple example uh, of social influence. So for example, if you look at the independent cascade model, which uh, was highlighted uh, by, for example, Kemper, uh, Kleinberg, Tadosh in their social influence paper. And if you look at this data, Essentially, it consists of two basic components. One of the components is uh, the network structure, which somehow try to model uh, social networks. Right? And the other part is other numbers, which I put down here, is a probability uh, sets, which to a larger degree try to be used to define an influence process, and how nodes impact their neighbors or influence their neighbors. Right? So let me just give you a very simple example how uh, we can use the, uh, the additional data to define a process over the, the network structure. Okay? Uh, you know, it, it, before I had my daughter injured my back, I used to dance salsa quite regularly. And actually, when I was in Boston, two of my friends, uh, Anna and uh, Joe, came back from Joe's tours. Uh, he's, he's in the military, so from Japan. And she was a brilliant student at MIT at that time. So they decided to start with a dance academy in Boston. And uh, they just came back from Japan. And even though she's familiar with Boston, they started with uh, a couple of people they know, and particularly uh, you know, a brother, uh, uh, Johnny and uh, Andreas. So Johnny is a tall, beautiful uh, man, very shy. And he, you know, began to talk to some of his friends, to a small number of friends, to uh, learn salsa. And he was able to, with probability four, finally convert one of the friends. And some other friend probably didn't. He didn't talk loudly enough. And Andre is tall, but very outgoing. So he converted more friends, you know, through his interactions. And naturally, as they goes on, uh, the people who go to academy really uh, loved uh, you know, the dance of Anna and Joe. They are really among the top in the world in salsa dancing. It's not just an average dancer. They are really among the world class dancers. And essentially, they built a very good academy. Right? So this is sort of partially like a social influence. You can see that uh, the set of probability data somehow introduced another interactions over the network. Right? And, uh, so clearly, the probability data and network have certain interplays, and the interaction really define what happened on the network. Right? So, so this is basically part of our attempt to understand you know, what is the multifaceted network data, and particularly how they interface with each other. And uh, <coughs> so in this talk, I will focus upon a very <coughs> narrow-minded, simple question. Uh, hopefully, it will give me some thought process to expand into broader understanding. That is, uh, what is impact, for example, of the influence process to network centrality? <coughs> because network centrality is one of the very basic concepts. And I would like to see how, how, to, how can we integrate the data of the probability process on the network and the network data to define who is more important. Right? So, how many of you heard about page rank? So, uh, so this is wonderful because uh, essentially it's a great framework to think about centrality. So what is centrality? Roughly speaking, or schematically speaking, it's a map from network data into a vector of n place. And each entry is a numerical measure attempt to capture how significant is a node in the network. Right? So, <coughs> so so for example, page rank is one of the popular measure for web search and many other applications. And uh, so essentially, 
it's sum up equal to n, and but it's uh, distributed in a fashion intuitively correlated with the importance of node in network. But clearly, formulation of centrality is a, an inverse problem, right? We have to somehow figure out what do we mean important, how do we measure them? And not surprisingly, there are many other centrality measures have been proposed in the literature. Uh, last time I checked, at least there are 50 or plus, right? And for example, in uh, <coughs> protein network, people often measure the betweenness to signify whether a protein is significant or not, right? And there's many other things built upon local degree, distance, what I will loosely call local sphere of influence, right? And uh, <coughs> so network influence is one kind of dynamic process over network. And in many ways, for example, a page rank also implicitly or explicitly assume some kind of dynamic process, which is called random walk, right? But intuitively, this random walk is very different from social influence, right? First of all, random walk is a sort of conservation property, namely its probability mask, and then it's always sum up equal to one. And social influence, like disease or spread of ideas, they somehow all expanding. So just from this nature, they don't always look the same. So intuitively, that uh, <coughs> centrality measures based solely on the static measure of the network, if you don't look at the influence data, somehow may not be sufficient enough to capture the centrality in this phenomenon, right? So how do we define this? So let me give you one example. I would like to keep this example, at least you can do your calculation throughout the talk, and later I will come back to this issue, just to at least give us a little bit of highlight of interplay, right? Imagine there's a social network just of a single edge between my daughter Sonia and myself, and uh, suppose, you know, she has probability P to, to influence me, and I have probability Q of influence her, but from a network perspective, it's just a single edge, right? And page rank may just give you half, you know, one one, right? So clearly, intuitively, when p is equal to q, we have the same centrality, intuitively. But when p is bigger than q, intuitively, c should have bigger centrality, right? So I want you just think along to think about what score you will gain, right? And particularly when you know, in most of the days, the p just look very big compared with my q to her. Okay, so this is. A, one of the simple network with a very simple model is actually it's also part of this uh, independent cascade model on a single edge. Okay. <clears throat> so, so let's take a step back. Try to integrate some of those data. So we have these two sets of data: topology of a network and the uh, stochastic process on the network. And I feel that it's actually more natural to define the interaction data not on the network itself, but on the power set of the vertex of the network for social influence. You know, you can see it's exponentially large, but as mathematicians, let me first go there, then we come back to see whether we can project back on the network. Okay? So <coughs> intuitively, in this social influence model, or broad model of influence, we somehow try to capture what is the probability that the set can influence the other set, right? So in some sense, the process of uh, stochastic influence <coughs> ultimately define a table, exponentially large, two to the n by two to the n, of this type of probability data, right? In my mind, this is really the underlying model, the underlying interplay of these two sets of data. And they are succinctly defined often, you know, even though this table is huge, but you have a simple process to define it, okay? And there's another way to somehow look at the interplay. And in fact, in the KKT paper, I think in the third page or second page, or actually in the abstract, they mentioned that they would like to capture social influence by so-called influence spread. So the, which means they take a, a compression of this data to, for every set, they define what is expected influence. So this is called influence spread. <laughs> what is the expected influence, right? What, what's the probability as influence t, and you're looking for this probability, right? So this is called influence spread. And uh, so 
mathematically, you can think about this data actually is a dimensional reduction of this data, right? Because it's a higher dimension. This is defined on two to them. Okay. So <coughs> when I began to look at those table uh, with my uh, colleagues Wei Chen, uh, we began to take a, a very simple view, which uh, actually sometime I teach in my class, is called the cooperative game. So, so this data has been studied in the 50s. We call cooperative game. Namely, what is the utility of a subset? Right? They also define on two to them. So in many ways, social influence, if you compress all the way to influence spread, essentially it defines a cooperative game of social influence. Right? Every subset has some power of influence. Right? And uh, if you take uh, this perspective, immediately there's a, a very natural solution concept for centrality, which has been studied in the 50s. Right? It's called uh, the Shapley value. Okay. So uh, Shapley just passed away, I think, a few, um, within two months. He, he bro his 92 broke his hip, unfortunately, and he died in two, uh, two months ago. And uh, brilliant mathematician, actually, not just uh, in the application. And he defined the Shapley value. He, he also, you know, centrality essentially map all those data into n-dimensional vector, you know, continuous dimensional reduction. And for each node in the network, if you have this utility, the Shapley value is defined to be so-called expected margin of, marginal contribution of this node. In other words, he basically let everyone come to Yale in a random order. While people enter the building of inns, he will measure the utility of people before that person and measure the utility of, of that person plus people in, already in the building. Then he will take a difference. That's called marginal contribution. And he takes expectation across the uniform permutations. This, you can see, later on can be parameterized using weighted and many other ways. But for now, it's just uniform expectation of marginal contribution. And this clearly is look like you know, a beautiful formula and heavily studied in the 50s. And uh, particularly, Shapley's beautiful axiom uniquely characterized this as a possible measure of so-called power index, or how sort of utility should be distributed, or how money should be distributed in business. Right? Because it satisfies so-called efficiency condition, namely, the sum of everyone's Shapley value is the utility of the total set. And uh, it's symmetric because if two nodes have the same marginal against every set, they have the same Shapley value. It's linear if you have two utility function, you take their convex combination or any combination, linear combination, you get Shapley value, take the linear form. So this is basically what I call linearity of expectation. And uh, it also, it has this beautiful property. If a node has zero margin against any set, it will get zero. And he proved that among this uh, set of maps from utility function into an uh, n-dimensional vector, this is a unique solution. OK, this is Shapley value. So, so let me recast a little bit. So essentially, I would like to study this project, the subject a little bit from sort of network analysis perspective. Right? So that is, uh, uh, when we have a social influence instance, uh, we temporarily compress data into the influence spread. And then I would like to use Shapley value as at least a possible measurement of centrality. OK, so this is basically the, the map. And, uh, so naturally, this is a continuous dimensional reduction, as I mentioned, right? From prob probabilistic data to utility data, then to the centrality data. And we would like to understand what does Shapley centrality capture. I'm not trying to say this is the only centrality measure. I just would like to understand a little bit what it capture, right? So, so I believe this turned out to be a very fantastic problem in the following sense. 
So far, I define nothing. Everything was defined a long time ago. Graph was defined hundreds of years ago, and uh, social influence was first captured in the 50s and uh, repopularized in 2000. And the uh, Japanese value and cooperative game was also done way before my birth. Right? So it's, this is wonderful research. You define nothing. Then you, do, you just need to analyze them. Right? So because otherwise, every time I define something, people ask me to justify. I always fail to justify them properly. Here, basically, I just do my best. And people at least say I've studied this. Right? <laughs> so, so now we are in the you know, age of network science and big data. And uh, there are a few things which nowadays probably important to us. One is that when we have a solution concept, we like it to be mathematically meaningful. Somehow we can capture them mathematically. Secondly, we want them algorithmically scalable, that we can compute it fast. And uh, I mean, it's even better we can justify them experimentally, match exactly what we observe. Right? So sometimes it's a tall order to get all those lined up. And I will try to at least uh, present some of our initial findings along those direction. Okay, so let me first talk about algorithm because I also would like to use this to give you a little bit more feelings of uh, Shapley value and so on. And uh, so before I come back to uh, touch upon this conceptual question, what does Shapley value capture? Right. So. So there's a lot of challenges to compute Shapley value. Was, uh, it has been widely known. So for example, the Shapley value of a voting game, which is view as a simpler game than this, political vote alliance, is Shapley complete. Shapley complete is basically like counting how many MP problem, how many solutions to an MP problem. That's called Shapley complete. Okay? And actually, if you just compute an influence spread, for independent cascade model, if you want to do it exactly, that's also sharply complete. Right? Sharply value has an exponential number of terms, right? When you write down this expectation. Right? So those don't seem to be surprising. Okay. So we want to approximate them fast. Okay. And I would like to consider a model which is more general than independent cascade. And in fact, it's a model which in uh, KKT model as one of the most general models. Okay, it, they call it triggering model. So triggering model is actually a fairly simple model. Essentially, it says that everyone has a triggering set that are randomly generated according to some distribution, right? So for example, when they put into network, they said, look at all the people pointing to you, and there's some distribution on their power set. And during influence, a subset may chosen according to some distribution. And uh, if one of them was influenced, you will be influenced. So that's a triggering model. It's actually captured, for example, independent cascade and many other models. Just to say, so you're saying the triggering model, and under the triggering model, there are certain people who, if they adapt the behavior, then you will. Mm -hmm. okay. They will go before you, yeah. They can influence you. They can, a certain set of people who can influence yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, certain set of people who can influence you. Okay, so this is stochastically produced, mm -hmm. right? So this actually was really the essence of all the KKT proof, mm -hmm. because uh, they essentially separate the influence into two steps. They said uh, within the triggering model, essentially you can first produce the triggering set, then you just simply use reachability to calculate for influence, right? So for example, uh, for every node, if you Asking who can trigger it, for example, you say this can trigger this, with a probability, you know, point one, you flip successfully, and if you produce this infrastructure of who trigger whom, then suddenly if Anna and Joe get two students, then whoever they can reach in this uh, life graph will be the student of her class, right? So this is the triggering model, and uh, this life graph it clearly is produced stochastically according to this trick, uh, the influence process. Right? But they separate it in two steps, and most of their proof essentially take a, you know, expectation on this, uh, on this equation. The probability S influence T is equal to T can be reached from S in one of this life graph. Okay? Uh, so like Markov chains, 
Sometimes it's much more convenient to think things re in reverse order. Right? Markov chains, we often say random walk goes forward. And sometimes it's better to see where you come from where you come from. So this is called a reverse model. And influence too, you can define this reverse structure. Who influenced, you know, rather than Dan influence me and I am being influenced by Dan. From my perspective, I'm looking for the source of influence. Okay? So for example, if you randomly choose a person, it will track who influenced this person, and that person will track who influenced it, you get one of these so-called reverse influence sets. Also in this stochastic way. You can define this just from the triggering model. Right? You can choose another random node, and then you can figure out who influenced this person and continue until it stops. You get another set, and sometimes you get some other set. It can be very complex. I'm just uh, illustrating some simple things we can do on PowerPoint right now. So this is called reverse influence model. And this turned out to be a more useful model, a way to look at the influence model than actually looking forward. So somehow reversely, st reverse structure can carry beautiful information for algorithmic development. Then you just keep on marching forward. And this actually is one thing KKT missed. They always think about influence going forward. They actually never in the paper address. What if you look backwards? And uh, some of my colleagues, uh, when we were studying page rank, we used this model. They moved on. For example, the first scalable influence maximization paper was written only a few years ago and used this influence structure in a reverse way. Right? Essentially, using this identity that the influence spread is really equal to n times the probability s intersect with a random reverse set. And with this, uh, the influence maximization suddenly have a scalable algorithm. Before that, it's at least quadratic time. Right? This is greatly simplified uh, how to sample influence set. Okay? And I think the, the state of art is this paper now. Uh, this year, uh, last year from Sigmund, they combined Martin Go with this uh, process to really tighten the analysis. It's beautiful work. Even though it looks quite simplistic, you just reverse look at the influence process. Okay? And for us, we also derive an identity for Shapley value this way. And remarkable, it's not approximation, it's just identity. Right? In fact, you can write down Shapley value in this broad Influence model as the following. The Shapley value of nodes is equal to, you produce one of these reverse set, and your member of it divided by the side of set. And this happened to be an unbiased estimator for Shapley value. OK? So you can see immediately the usefulness of this algorithmically, right? because it gave you a rapid sampling algorithm. Because normally, Shapley value can sample, but it's in factorial terms, the, the, you have to have strong concentration to do something. And this basically compress many cases into this life graph, and you compress them down. I, I don't actually understand the expression. What do you mean by U in R and this bracket? So this, is a, uh, this indicator okay. is either 0 or 1. Okay. And this is a random uh, this is a cardinality. I should do a better LaTeX thing, sorry. Yeah. So basically, you reversely produce this uh, who influence whom in the tracking, random node tracking down. You look whether yourself is actually the one. The, the set gener generates the following. You, 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 you randomly, you, randomly you, you give it this influence model, you choose a one randomly, and then you ask it to produce who influenced it? That you, you just ask this oracle for this stochastic process. It will tell you who influenced it from its uh, in neighbor. You just include them all in the you know, in a queue. You just iteratively do this until you stop. And that infrastructure is a uh, 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 that infrastructure is the, the, this thing. Oh, sorry, somehow my. Yeah, it's basically you choose a uniform distribution according to where you want to study. You produce this inverse set. So 
Yeah, so this uh, basically, for example, randomly here, you continue to track who influenced whom using this stochastic process. Yeah, why did you stop? I mean, the, the oh, that is basically in, in this, uh, 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 nobody That's produced a new thing anymore, yeah. Well, no, because the last person could have gotten, there was still, um, in this Yeah, yeah, it just happened, all the flip, we calling flip failed. Oh, I see. All the, you know, you, you keep on doing this, you have a big graph, this is coming back with some pieces. Right, you come back with uh, pieces of yeah, yeah, so it's a reversely realizable uh, set from an uh, individu random individual's perspective. You literally look everything backwards. So, so that's why I... But doesn't that intuitively then oversample local regions? Because, I mean, the combined probability that you'll reach, most of those little sets will by almost by definition be small little sets. It can small. be large, right? For example... Uh, depend on the instance, but, you know, but the... the Mathematically, if you calculate out, everything was just right as this expectation, then you clearly study the variance and those things. They have often better concentration properties. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so basically, you know, if you want to, yeah, so that's a, my artistic drawing of the rivers. You look at the other direction, right? So, so this gives the estimate for Shapley value. And so far, for example, we can prove uh, a sampling algorithm if you give certain parameter settings of the precision, it can give you, for example, a scalable algorithm based upon certain relative measures. Okay? So particularly, we can get all the Shapley value within epsilon times the largest individual influence in almost linear time. And actually, it's a better parameterize. Actually, somehow this quantity, if you choose k to be log n, that seems to be in the practice. You look at the, what, is the, uh, what is the ratio of expected uh, uh, individual influence, which can quickly reduce, worse this pr particular parameter, it seems to track the concentrations What's right now. K, K is uh, basically, uh, each parameter basically measure how do you uh, want to estimate the expected influence uh, when you draw according to the degree, otherwise it's just uh, uh, worse the case largest entries in the Shapley value. Right. And we actually have an experiment to show th this is essentially always less than one. So, so which means that for most of those cases, uh, the approximation just uh, 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 in, in, in almost a linear time. Okay. And it's always uh, unbiased, and we always sum up equal to n, so they are always somehow normalized. So I would like to return mostly to these uh, mathematical questions. What does Shapley value capture? Right. So we will follow, you know, the, you know, step of many of beautiful previous work, particularly including Shapley's axiomatization. At least try to capture some basic case under which it will uniquely identify Shapley value as a solution, and hopefully they will provide as a framework when, if we want to compare with other centrality measures. Okay. Uh, so naturally, we want to come up with simple axioms that identify a particular solution concept, right? So axiomatization normally takes two forms. One is uh, uh, you want to just begin to put down your desirable properties, and you would like to study the boundary when you have a solution, when you don't have a solution, like Arrow did for voting. And then basically, you can study when you relax certain axioms or properties, whether you can find a good enough solution, right? So this, you really study the boundary of feasibility. The other one is that we have certain candidate of solution. We would like to characterize them with very simple axioms, right? So, so I would like to, you know, we have a lot of blueprint from before, so it gave us a framework to, to move forward. And I would like to capture the influence process, okay? It's not just utility, the influence process, okay? So essentially, I would like to present six simple axioms that uniquely represent the Shapley value. Namely, we need to prove a soundness part of theorem to say that Shapley value satisfy all axioms, and the completeness part of theorem to say that the solution to this is unique. Therefore, it uniquely captures the Shapley value. 
Okay. So the first one is all you know, it's always a simple one. I don't I hope no one argue with me. This uh, is not a good axiom. <laughs> so gradually you can debate with me because I have some doubt on my axiom too sometimes, right? So so intuitively, what is a good centrality measure for social influence? If you permute people, centrality should just permute. They should be invariant on the permutations. You know, whether this person called Dan Spielman or not, it's not that important, right? Your parents could name you different names, <laughs> right? <Maybe>. So, <laughs> oh, Wang Wu, so, sorry. Uh, so, so this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, so intuitively, when you permute, uh, centrality should just permute, right? It's invariant on the permutations. And it's really about the, how things are influenced, how the inf dynamic is spread. It's not about labels of nodes. So second one is uh, no, uh, centrality normally we normalize them because uh, it's really the relative that, import. But that assumes there's no, um, I mean, there's an assumption buried in there. So for example, assume that the production function is conjoined. So let's say you're, you're a baby, the influence of a man in being able to produce a baby with his partner depends on whether that partner is a woman, not another man. So uh, I think this, that today may not be true anymore. No, right? no, no. <laughs> no I'm just saying. Yeah, I'm not talking about no, no, no. unions. I'm talking about literally you know, yeah. production as, an, as a trivial dichotomous example. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. my influence, you know, in other words, these, these, if I've understood what you just said, it suggests that it, that there's an independence of my performance that's independent of who the actual neighbors I have are. No, actual label, not neighbors, label. I can call my node one, two, three, four, five, six, or I can call them A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Oh, that's fine, yeah. yeah, it's not, nothing beyond that. It's just a name, label. Oh, right. that's, that, that, that's this capture. So it's a really very minimal condition. Right? When you permute, if I rename it, somehow the Centrality just go with the whatever intrinsic to that node, right? Okay. So uh, normally we normalize it because uh, it, it really measures the uh, the relative significance. So why don't we just normalize them equal to one on average? Because page rank actually normalize equal to one, or well, one over n, depending on who you talk to, and. Uh, 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 normally, to one has some simplicity because uh, we, we always know how, how, how much is how much, right? Because it's just average to one, right? So relatively, if I scale it, it's, I still call it same centrality, right? So I, it's in the projective space right now. And uh, so the third axiom touch upon what I call isolated nodes. So in every society, there's always loners. Nobody can influence them, they influence nobody. Right? You can precisely write out to say, for every subset involving them, it's as if they, are, they don't exist, other than they influence themselves. OK? So, so this, if you do a basic check, you see indeed they influence themselves equal to 1. And uh, <coughs> anything else, including them, if S is not uh, uh, U is not in S, it will be equal to zero. So no one influences them, they influence nobody. So this is a totally isolated members of this influence phenomena. Then we would like to say they just get their own unit back as if they don't exist in the system. So basically, as if you're working with a network, one side is smaller. So that's an advantage actually average to one. You just let them take their own credits away, and you actually, the influence is measured. Centrality is measured in the rest of the graph. Okay, it doesn't mean that people have centrality always bigger than one because some people have centrality less than one, which you will see the case. So this is one of the boundary case, and uh, the next one, which also this basically some ba very basic outliers of a network influence. We want to at least understand how we. How we, uh, what properties of influence centrality they have, right? So here is another sort of very extreme type of uh, nodes that they influence nobody. This is true in all, also in almost all societies. There's always someone who stops influence other people. Uh, it's extreme. They may not always exist, but supposedly exist. This means that uh, 
<coughs> you are so-called sync nodes, that uh, any set involve you is still most influenced cast by the rest of the sets. And your job is whether to decide where, whether yourself is still activated or not. Right? This also indicating you can only influence yourself, right? just for sanity check. So this is what we often call the sync node. But why do you add in to see a copy? Pardon me? If it looks natural to add, to add in to add, but why do you add in to see? Oh, you mean uh, in, in, in this case? Yeah. So basically, you want to capture whether, uh, so suppose S influence P plus U, then clearly nothing changed. If you add to S, nothing changed. So basically, uh, their existence is just to include themselves into the set. If other people haven't put them in the set, that's why if they are in the right. Because here, uh, social influence often we don't say you don't you uninfluence yourself. You are always the subset of the. So this is basically the artifact of that property. So, so the set that you influence is always a, a super set, or at least as big as yourself set. You don't uninfluence yourself in in this family of definitions. So this is basically partially that artifact. Okay. And uh, so, so we want to have a very mild uh, classification of sync nodes. Uh, so sync nodes can be projected out. Because they have no impact to other nodes, you can define a projected instance by just remove it and then try to recontribute what the influence model is. So this is a natural mathematical projection. And uh, so essentially, we have Axiom basically said, if you have two sync nodes, if you project out of out one, it has no impact to the centrality of the other sync nodes. We didn't even say about anything else. We just simply say, you have two sync nodes. Nobody, they, they, they don't influence anybody else in the system. If you project out of one, the other centrality didn't change. Because its centrality is solely decided by the rest of members who can influence it. Right. So we did put it back this thing into when we project, we actually put it back this part. We basically said as influence T, in all the time, basically you have to count whether U is in it or not. But if U is not is removed, this both of the probability was add to to the impact of T because U is projected out. So this is related with uh, Right, it's, no, it's not a flow. For my effort to influence you doesn't make me less likely to influence you. Right. Right. So, right. That so that's the, the, the four. And the fifth is a very natural one. Um, it is a family of influence model, which also widely studied. It's not just, uh, you know, it, it, there's many studies, people design efficient algorithm for this instance, called the Bayesian influence model. That is, you know, Imagine you're selling different goods, and for different goods, iPhones or medical device or something else, you may follow a slightly different influence process. Right? But suppose there's a state of nature distributed among those products, and for real, basically, you have a distribution on the particular influence model that they may be applied to a social network, then uh, there influence model is just simply take the expectation of this Bayesian uh, model. And here, basically, uh, we like the centrality measure to satisfy linearity of expectation, because there's no other prior data on this uh, uh, influence model. Mm -hmm. Your influence is the average of the of those model. So this can be de it's debatable, but, uh, but but I'm trying to characterize Shapley centrality. So naturally, I would draw intuition from the Shapley formulation as well, right? So so that's why when we study other centrality measure, we can come back to understand whether we should redefine those expectations, right? Because uh, 
uh, we have to explain it on how we need to handle this uh, basic model, for example. So last one actually uh, entangled with a little bit with uh, a game theory. And so let me come back to, so I don't know how many of you have uh, your own data on this. How do you assign P and Q now? Uh, let me simplify your life. Let me simplify, simplify your life. And most of the time between parents and children, it's <laughs> like this. <laughs> you have no influence to your kids, right? So, so intuitively, I would like to at least mentally think, how would you like to as assign centrality? So first of all, clearly, Sona gets a higher centrality than me, intuitively. But on the other hand, I can influence myself. So in some sense, I don't get a zero. Because I have some kind of ability to influence in this network. I can influence myself. Right? So how do you assign centrality now? And uh, so this is a time, actually, you can go back to the 50s. People study this uh, all the time. For example, if you look at Nash bargaining, it provides a solution. Okay. How do Nash bargaining solve this problem? Nash, if you simply ask my daughter to say, what value do you think your father has? She said, nothing. <laughs> I influence him. <laughs> right? So my default is zero. Right? Because she really thinks I, I don't influence her. And Nash comes back to me and says, what do you think about your daughter has in this game. And since I don't influence her, I will say she gets at least one. Because I still influence myself. I have an understanding how much that we are playing. So now she basically says, OK, the critical value is uh, I'm zero and so is one. So essentially, we're bargaining for last dollar now. But his form formula for last dollar in this simple case, he just said, you split that. So that uh, and he, this is also axiom to uniquely define this bargaining and widely used. And that's, for example, we'll give I have a half, and she has 1.5. Because that's the bargaining of the last units. So one, how can you have two halves? Because she had, one, she had one, I have zero to start with. We're bargaining the last dollar, and we split it. I split the last dollar, I got a half. And she got three halves of the dollar? Because she had one already. They got the other half. Oh, she had one already. And this has many properties that Nash also axiomatizes this. Right. So initially, I was hoping this will just settle the whole. Uh, uh, what would be the split if, it was, if the P and Q were 50-50? Then it would be one and one. Yeah, P and Q is the same, it would be one and one. If P is equal to Q, it would be one and one. And this also gave you the PQ split. Nash basically said, when ask me, I will say C worth basically uh, one minus Q because I can, right? So, so, so there basically you can see P minus Q eventually played into this system. Right. Okay. So that's basically the generic solution of that. Shapley value takes exactly this view actually. Because Shapley value says half our chance she come before me, she collect all the influence, and half our chance I come before her. And I, at least I get my own uh, myself. Right? So, that, 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 so this match with Shapley value. So uh, we didn't quite pin down Shapley value here, in part because, uh, let me say, as a parent, I want to influence my kids. And this is Yale. And uh, I saw that uh, the tiger parents send their kids to Yale. <laughs> no, I'm just, uh, so, so this is one way to influence uh, your children. So basically, so you have to. Do what I say. But in life, that's not the case. Often you have two parents. And sometimes you have three parents. <laughs> right? So, uh, so for example, we consider a very extreme case of this type of influence. That is, uh, imagine you have a set and a special individual. And if they all agree, they will impact this node. Otherwise, they just impact themselves. Right? If they all agree, the impact. If all parents are united, you, get, you, you impact your children. Otherwise, your children will not be influenced, because we know that's true, actually, in reality. Uh, so this basically, you write down this instance. is just follow this probability. Uh, R impact R plus U, or R plus U impact R plus U equal to 1. And the rest of the time, everybody just influences themselves, every set. 
There's no other. So we would like to at least understand how, for example, uh, centrality are allocated here with uh, some additional principle that is consistent with Shapley assignment. Okay. So, you know, negotiating with many people is hard, right? I don't, uh, you know, if both parents are united, that's all the baby can do. Just follow them. If both parents are not united, they become a, a monster, <laughs> right? So, so which means they have a more e e power of index. So Nash normally model this by, <coughs> in his bargaining model, he assigns a power index to individual in the bargaining to capture basically how hard it is for the other individual to bargain. And uh, so if you apply to a two-player bargaining game, one player has units R, namely all the parents together, but the children has R to one ratio of power of influence, uh, of uh, determination, then Nash formula actually gave R over R plus one to the children. So this actually is exactly Shapley value did. It needs some proof, but uh, if it goes through all the reverse structure, it's actually proof of this one, R plus, o, R plus one. So this is basically the six axioms we take for the very extreme case and general principle. And we are able to prove that uh, they uniquely characterize the Shapley social influence. Okay. So this is basically the, so, so let me just give a very highlight how this thing improved. It's actually very linear algebraic. So in the simplest picture, we follow uh, another giant in uh, game theory and economic model, Myerson. And uh, so he actually gave a beautiful proof of Shapley's axiom. And essentially go as following, that uh, you treat the instance as a vector space, and you essentially use axiom to build the basis. Then you prove that uh, <coughs> the uh, axiom will put a unique assignment on your basis, and uh, the linearity of expectation will expand to all the utilities. So that, that's a, the quickest uh, outline of Myerson proof of Shapley uh, axioms. Okay, so in our case, it's slightly more complex than this, in part because we are dealing with much bigger dimensions. Right, we our input is a probabilistic profile rather than utility profile. Right, so that's basically most of the pages when we write this proof, we have to be more careful to handle those probability profile, because we are based on the influence model rather than influence spread. We don't want to write based on spread because you already put some assumption there. And uh, the probability profile clearly has higher dimension than the uh, utility profile. So, so the intrinsic dimension actually is this. If you work it out, if it goes through, basically it's a, a set of S and T relationship. S is a subset of T because this is because of this model, right? You, you don't uninfluence yourself. And, uh, <coughs> You, you, you don't have to take empty sets and the whole thing. And that's actually, if we work out, it's indeed the dimensionality of that probability table. So that is literally that probability table, dimensionality, if you treat as a vector. Right, because probability add up equal to one across all s, there's many constraints that you have to remove it. Right. And uh, so essentially, we are able to break down the axiom to have the basic null instance is everyone's isolated, because in this case we can use one of the axiom to uh, assign, it's just one, 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 one. And uh, the basis instance is just composition of this, uh, uh, what we call critical sets. You know, a, a bunch of uh, member, they can only unitedly influence a node. And uh, you can use this together with uh, so-called sync nodes to build out a set of bases, okay? And that allow you to cover exactly the, the, all the, in, the instances. So basically, this alone, together with the linearity, will expand it out. And uh, with the null instance, it will give you the full space. Right, so that, that's the very sketchy of the proof. OK. And uh, so, so once you have proof, this actually imply other properties, which you don't capture in the axiom. For example, it, this uh, Shapley centrality 
uh, satisfies symmetry uh, property. Node with the same marginal influence will get the same centrality. That just comes from the utility now. <coughs> and it also have like basic independence of irrelevant alternative. Namely, if you have two isolated influence components, the centrality is literally done in the individually by the components. Right, those you can just all derive from these basic properties. Right. So that summarizes the, the, the axiomatization of uh, the centrality. And I, we hope basically this allows us to comparatively look at other options of uh, centrality formulation. Because you can easily see where they fail and uh, in which way you want to understand why that is important if you want to use as a measurements. Does that have five minutes to close off? Yeah, that's okay. So um, <coughs> I have to say my, my, my course essentially did all the experiments. I, I claim no credit here. I'm just trying to interpret some of the data which uh, he wrote. Uh, the experiments. And uh, so we did run on some of experimental data. And it actually allowed us to discover new theorems. I, then I call that's really successful experiments. You actually identify a mathematical theorem. Okay? So essentially, we run from small data all the way to really large data. And our algorithm actually did run through. You know, it's, it's quite scalable. It just literally runs through. So this reversible set is very uh, often concentrated very sharply. Okay. And when we compare with your sample with permutation, you know, all the per factorials, you really don't concentrate nearly. Uh, you know, it's far more con uh, concentrated this way. How do they measure the influence? Pardon me? How do they measure the influence? So they set up the, okay, so very good. That's my next slide. So all the weights clearly are set. And this is one thing I'm hoping to lead to machine learning. People actually try to learn the probability from topic modeling and so on. They try to model the probability, particularly, they, for example, for the data mining, uh, they, uh, that's one of the testing. That's why we like this case, because, uh, uh, in, for example, KDD paper, they just use a degree, right? Because they're theorists. So then, you know, your degree of influence is your in-degree, one of your in-degree. They're theorists, then they write their paper. And eventually, <coughs> in practice, people try to capture those uh, probability. And uh, learning is one of the schemes I try to understand the sort of, uh, when, when I give you enough observations, uh, together with additional information, in which way you can capture this stochastic influence. I don't think I, I'm expert, so I, it's one thing I have been reading quite heavily recently. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, we did a synthetic one, uh, like the degree, or we also use a page rank because uh, we feel it's slightly more smoother than degree. We want to take comparisons. Right? And uh, so let me first share about the theorem we discovered. You know, you think you know everything. Then when you write the code, you say, wow, this is strange. And very often, if it's always true, if it's always strange, there must be something true. Right? So, it, 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 so so here is a, a, a influence model people often use as experiments. At least now I can claim that I somehow understand a little bit more about social influence now. When people are become slightly lazy, here is the wrong social influence. They produce a network, or they get a piece of network. Typically, it's undirected. Then they just go on, assign probability randomly, P and Q, a PUV, and they make it all symmetric. So that's, then they run, they said, oh, our experiments show even better performance on this model. So they said, in practice, our algorithm do it better than theory. Or, so, so they often use this model without actually knowing this model is exceptionally special. You know, we, we, that's the first model we grabbed, right? Because if you grab from uh, other uh, data set, this is the first model. We run, we always get Shapley value one everywhere. And then you think about it, actually, you get the proof. Mm -hmm. It's equal to 1. This is highly, highly special influence data. Never happened in practice. Even if 
everyone's, if my influence on you is always saying your influence on me. Yeah. If you think about this life graph, it's become very clear. It's just the connectivities. And, and Shapley value beautifully identifies this. It's just it's really special. Right? So, so at the beginning, clearly, uh, my, my friend first said, I think there's something wrong with the code. <laughs> Right, because, because it's independent of a network, independent of the, the number you put in, then he gets the network smaller and smaller, it's still equal to one. Because he said it's probably precision things, and algorithm didn't converge. They all converge into one very rapidly. And uh, I think more, 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 than, uh, more truthful than not is basically this really short limitation of this model. Right, first of all, this is a very weird condition of influence. Total symmetry. And it is really happening in real world propagation because uh, we all know that uh, we don't have a our mutual influence is not identical. Right? So, so Shapley value remarkably revealed the symmetry. If you have a symmetric graph with symmetric probability, Shapley value equal to one. And uh, I think Shapley value is an attempt to measure some kind of uh, irreplaceable power in the social influence, rather than say who individually can Im impact a lot of people. Right? It's not about individual influence. It's really a summary of group influence. In this uh, group influence data, in which way you measure each individual's importance. It's not just how much I can influence by myself, stand alone, independent of other people. Right? So if you replace ball, then you have a lower Shapley value because in the group influence, you will be replaced. Right? So, so this, in some sense, really captures that uh, in this very, very symmetric model, uh, mathematically, everyone is replaceable. Right? Just like if uh, you have a deterministic network, if one person agree to, 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 to study network science, if everybody agree, then clearly everyone is equally powerful because you just need one person to agree. Right. So this actually points out that. Uh, I find it fantastic. You basically, when you run the first experiments, you said, I really don't know what I'm talking about. Right. But then at least you can mathematically capture this, this thing. So, so, so we did compare some of the runnings. And it's very interesting when we run on the learned model, the individual influence and the Shapley value are reasonably aligned. We couldn't interpret. We are still trying to investigate. You can see those are the top 10 in the, this data mining set. And uh, they are quite aligned individually. And the Shapley value, they all, the important players are all large. But on the other hand, if you run, for example, based on degree or page rank, they often uh, constant fraction are mismatched in, in the top list if you continue to scan down. You know, for example, uh, Falucius, a fr good friend of mine, and uh, he showed up in Shapley value. He actually, individual influence is not uh, the dominant players in the network. If you even use a, a page rank, which already summarized something. So it's a kind of interesting phenomenon. I don't have a perfect answer to this. And uh, we are still looking into a lot of this type of data. But the learned model, on, on the other hand, somehow, uh, I don't know whether it's justified learning model or not, but I don't have a good answer to this. But they're very aligned. And this is not what the data we made up. You just run this, it give you this table. <coughs> so we want to understand a little bit more. Uh, and, uh, but our experiment did show that we don't need much precision because the things concentrate pretty fast. I'm not going to over this now. And they actually uh, even use a, a seed selection for influence maximization. The Shapley value one doesn't perform too poorly. On some instance, they do because they didn't capture individual influence, right? Because sometimes you just want one seed. You may get a poor Shapley one, right? Because in a symmetric case, you say everyone is good. But for individual influence, that's not true. So uh, there's certain discrepancy. We continue to try to capture them. Hopefully, this axiomatization will allow us to comparatively examine what are the discrepancy between individual influence. It's almost like a degree. And what is Shapley measurement? It's almost like a page rank. Right? Somehow, you take a 
you, you take some kind of uh, transitive type of properties. And uh, so this is basically part of the effort of axiomatization to isolate out simple instance. And uh, so this, the other thing basically say why it's very often uh, concentrated because most of the data we just run, we didn't make up too much of our own data. They, they do show that uh, uh, the, if you go to log n Shapley value, compared with like expectation of the individual influence, they actually are relatively small number. I don't have mathematical proof how to model this thing. And under such case, uh, the approximation of Shapley value is scalable because our complexity is really driven by such ratios, even mathematically, okay? So, so this is my little exploration of the different fields network analysis, game theory, and scalable algorithm. And somehow when you put it together, I find they do have a very, inter very exciting interface, and it creates new questions that I just don't understand. And every time I feel like I got some intuition, very often experimentally I was wrong. And then you think mathematically, I was still wrong. Right, so uh, I find it's a very beautiful uh, space, and uh, naturally, we are hoping to continue to understand this basic question. What is the uh, interplay between a dynamic process and the network structure? How do we integrate different facets of network data? I find those are quite uh, plausible questions to continue to examine you know, our network phenomena and the network applications. And we, here locally, we make some uh, extension to like weighted the case. We try to characterize better with uh, like potential function and other game theoretical concept. And uh, we, we also get simpler axiomatization if I just want to characterize influence spread. I don't need to go home much harder. And uh, broadly, you know, I feel that I still mostly don't understand what I'm studying. I'm hoping to gain more deeper and broad understanding of uh, uh, the impact of dyma dynamic process on the network to other network concepts like clusterability, uh, uh, community identification, and for influence, there's also a certain notion of bounded rationality, right? Because you don't talk about influence everyone. I think Shapley value captured too much, right? You may have certain truncated version, and uh, we made some partial progress, but mostly I find myself in this heuristic thought process right now. And uh, in large, I really hope this will give some kind of step to set up a comparative framework for understanding network data. And uh, so this is basically my broad question of study, interplay between dynamic process and other things on the network structure. And uh, one of the projects right now I'm working on is trying to get different type of clusterability measured under the influence model. And I don't have too much good progress. There's some beautiful mathematical structures, but I just don't know what they mean right now. And uh, um, so there's a lot of similarity, actually, from Shapley value to page rank. They, they produce many stochastic matrix. So, so with this, thank you very much. I think this is one of our questions. Case where everyone has centrality equal to one. So uh, imagine there is a bottleneck somehow which connect two giant clusters together. So intuitively, this guy is, is very important. You will remove it, something basically the network breaks down. Mm -hmm. So how, how to justify the case that they have the same centrality? So I think it really depends on what, uh, uh, because when you say that it's important, you have some other models of what ha something happened on the network. And then that, that model didn't quite capture what, for example, people define symmetric independent cascade model. Because independent cascade is a very strong condition. And if link has a mutual uh, influence, that's a very extreme, extreme condition. So if you put yourself more thinking about those model, uh, it may separate from that intuition from what you think is important. I believe that, uh, from my own regard, that note is important. But for example, if everything is deterministic, that node is no more important than any other node. Because if you influence one, you influence the whole thing. 
Why do you say that node is important? Because this model didn't say it's important. Right? If you use some other data to say it's important. I think the first thing this makes very clear is that when we were talking about centrality, we were talking about an underlying process on a graph. And anything, right. any phenomenon you want to observe probably is a different notion of centrality. Yeah. So you, I think about what we hear a lot here about like Nicholas's work on trying to pick a small set of seeds to influence people. Mm -hmm. And as you said, you might get something very different if you have a small budget of seeds. Yeah, yeah, like a bounded but, rationality. You couldn't change, right? But yeah. you try changing the size of the set over which you're averaging. So, for example, someone's Shapley value might differ, but be very different if you consider adding them to random sets as opposed to random sets of only size three. Yeah, yeah. So we, th this is basically what I, what I hinted as a, a bounded rationality. Okay. So we attempt to better characterize that. Uh, we have some partial progress to limited uh, uh, the size of uh, influence, like to, to, to parameterize that as part of the axiom. And it just currently we don't have as clean yet, so that's why I didn't mm -hmm. put in the presentation. You know, I try to get it as simple as possible. But but clearly, uh, Shapley value missed certain things like uh, bounded, right, you know, bounded uh, budget of influence, right? Because uh, here I put in n minus one as a seed or n as a seed, they still have some influence, but in the bounded budget they have no influence, mm -hmm. right? So clearly they do impact, but that's a different process clearly. On the network, yeah. What happens if you just do a simple model? Take, take your graph and put on each node a, a power function, so like a potential, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then influence goes from high potential to low, to low potential. potential. Yeah. And not and less in the other direction. You just take the ratio mm -hmm. to these two ways of graphs. So is it stochastic or deterministic? Okay, you have a Markov process on the graph, okay. which is the usual Markov, the usual random walk. Mm -hmm. But then you put a drift on it. You put it by going from high pressure to low pressure. Suppose it's wind blowing. Right, or, right. Or say fire going, and uh, there's high, high atmospheric pressure, low atmospheric pressure. It'll go from high pressure to low pressure. Yeah, yeah. Right? Now, you change the pressure, everything is different, right? Which is what Dan was saying. Exactly, exactly. So those are the simplest possible models that mm -hmm. you can have. And then centrality and what's, what, where are going to be the dips where the fire is going to go to from, from some places. and. Let's say the highest centrality would be the place which is the most dangerous one. Yeah, yeah. In terms of uh, the epidemic propagation of fire or something. I, I agree. That, that, that's basically my initial motivation to look at the, when dynamic process change, how do we, our, our network concept change. And I don't have a broad answer yet for all different type of. Uh, so uh, it's just a very simple model. Right, right. So, so, so clearly. Uh, many of those will hopefully take a more systematic examination. And uh, uh, in this junction, basically, uh, we feel that it's good to take one model to walk through. And at least it will give us some framework to examine other uh, variation of random walk, other variation of uh, a network process. Yeah. So uh, I don't have broad answer yet, but uh, those are within what I would desire to have better understanding. Yeah. Thank you very much.